All right, I'm going to do this like a uh, sunshine thing again. God, this is going to be like a sun light. Okay. Um, just a quick note to begin with. We're going to be talking from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, and I'm amazed. Of course, my wife's been telling me this for years, but... Um, Basically, the way I'm studying this is, is just simply, uh, I use Bible Hub, it's a super easy tool, and I, I'm just looking up the original meaning of the words, and as we're going to see this morning, there's a word that keeps popping up, and uh, I mean, we've em emphasized it the last couple of weeks, and the word is, actually, do you, without Ronnie giving it away, anybody want to guess what it is? Other than futile and vanity, it's a, it's a good word. Whoops, I just said it. Good. Good. So this word good keeps popping up, but what you're going to see in your translation, and I'll show you uh, the couple of times that it comes up, I think it's two or three times in chapter three, you, most of the translations use a different word. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll show, I'll show, I hope to show you that uh, I think it's significant to use the word good and not some other word. Obviously, the interpreters, they're trying to look at context and, and try to, you know, they're trying to provide kind of a, uh, what they think is a good or clear picture of what the author is saying. But um, what I'm finding is that oftentimes uh, when you don't use, and you can't use the literal, the, you know, the, the literal word all the time. And... With Hebrew, there isn't necessarily a literal word every time that is uh, directly translatable to English. So interpreters are having to make a decision. So I, I'm not trying to paint the bad light of the interpreters, but uh, we'll, we'll see. So good. You guys remember, anybody remember what we talked about the last couple of Sundays in, in regards to the word good? One, first of all, what's it remind us of? Genesis. So it reminds us of Genesis, and just for uh, review's sake, um, what, does it remind, what does it remind you uh, about in Genesis? Well, God is the first one to use it, or at least it's attributed to God first, because he said it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. You guys all hear him? So God says it first, as he's creating... We see in Genesis chapter 1, he creates something. And again, that, that's a word that keeps coming up too. The, the word uh, to, to make or do. And that's going to come up here also. So God makes, he does, he creates. And what's he say after every time he, he creates something? He says it's good. It's good. So by extension, that he has a definition. You guys hear that? I can hear you because you're right here, but you're, it's really soft. You're, you're gentle here. So I said... Thank you. <laughs> because he uses it, he has a definition for it. It's defined in himself as to what it is. So God has a definition for that. It's just really easy for us. This is people, we, especially people that grow up in the church, we see a word, especially that word good. It's just a simple word that if you don't take time to think, well, wait a minute, God says something is good... And he's got a definition of what that good is. And the definition that I, for the life of me, I can't ever remember it, Jeff. So, it's a, so what is it again? That's like a range of means. Pleasing, yeah. pleasing, useful, suitable. Pleasing, useful, suitable. Desirable is wrong there. And desirable. Is there an E in there? Desirable? Just on the front. Huh? Just on the front. Okay. So desire. So, the, again, the Hebrew word for good, and, you know, I think God used that on purpose. It's, it's this kind of comprehensive uh, word that means pleasing, desirable, useful, and suitable. Um, any other thoughts come to mind regarding just kind of building this word good? From anybody? There's 
No, there's Ron. Yeah, great. Somewhere in there, way back, and I can open the drawer, but I can't find out why I put the kid in there, is I associated that after study with delightful. Delightful? Yeah. Okay, which is interesting because sometimes the interpreter will use words like that. Beautiful, delightful, pleasing. Okay, so delightful. So, yeah, so God has declared, and we, we've already said this, you know, a, a lot in, in chapters 1 and 2. God declares what is good. And in Genesis, what, what did Adam and Eve do? They, they wanted to make the decision about what was good for themselves. So instead of just resting and trusting God and what he has declared to be good already, Adam and Eve said... Hey, I want I reserve the right to make that decision for myself. And that that's in in simplified terms that's what went wrong with humans, okay? So, um, Adam and Eve wanted to to decide for themselves what was good or not good for themselves, and which is really interesting then when you you see how they they chose rather than kind of trusting God and relying and, and, and trusting him in what he, he said regarding uh, the two trees. So you had the two trees, and what were the two trees? The one tree was what? That they could eat from, to their heart's delight, was what? The tree of life. And guess what the other one was? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. So again, it's this idea that they wanted to choose, they wanted to determine for themselves with their own knowledge, what was good and what was not good for them. So we've already gone into great detail about that, and we just did it again. So now let's go to uh, chapter 3. So chapter 3, I'm just going to read the first uh, eight verses, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, so for everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under, under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Well, first of all, I want you to kind of observe... I want you to tell me what you observe here. And again, it's not a quiz question. Just what strikes you as we go through these uh, different things that Solomon's writing about. So there's a, se there's a time and a season for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. So just simple observation, you know, what, what strikes you about that section of verses and what Solomon is, is listing in there? Okay, so there's a time for everything. And what is it, I mean, do you want to explain that any more, Steve? Well, I think, I think life gets so busy that we, we think things are just happening in, a, in this uh, crazy, crazy speedy world type of situation and we don't realize that literally every day, whether it's interfacing with our wife and children or friends and stuff, that there's a, that times come and go. And, and we oftentimes miss them. Okay. I just, I just wrote life. You said life. Mm -hmm. There's a time for everything. There's a time for everything in life. If I already, I, I'm, I just can't. I know I'm using red, Steve. I, Emmanuel. I'm just going to keep on, I want to keep that on the board, just because Emmanuel, and again, it means what? God with us. God with us. God with us in what? In life. And I think it's something that we've emphasized already in Ecclesiastes, that we're seeing Solomon, and Solomon is pouring out his heart here, okay? We've already seen him in the first two chapters. He's pouring out his heart, and generally speaking, what are we seeing? He's thrilled. <laughs> He's thrilled. <laughs> He's looking back on his life and he is just excited and thrilled about it, right? 
Absolutely. That's obviously sarcasm. He is just thrilled at the way his life has gone, right? With the wisdom that God has given him. No, he's, he's not thrilled. He's looking back on it, and again, from a human, normal heart perspective, he's saying, it, it, in a sense, it's, it, it's almost worthless as far as whatever he was trying to get for himself, okay? Um, but this life, that life that Solomon is talking about, and the, and the life that Solomon is, is pouring out on paper right here, we believe that God is a God that, is, that strives with us in that life. And that's what we're seeing with Solomon here. So, Steve, you just brought up, hey, this idea of life, there's a time for everything. And then you said, in life, any other thoughts, you guys, regarding, uh, yeah, what these words? It, to me, it hard to back to the first chapter where he's talking about the world in this mechanical kind of way. You know, the, the sun rises, the sun sets, streams flow into the uh, ocean, but the ocean is never full. And in the same way, this seems to be saying, there's an absurdity to the fact that sometimes it's time to tear, sometimes it's time to sow again to go see. Yeah, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Because again, Solomon's looking at this from a from an analytical perspective. He's trying to figure things out, really. He's trying to understand how they work. How do these things go together? It's a great tie, you know, talking about, you know, the streams, he, like he says, the streams keep pouring into the sea, but the sea doesn't fill up. How does that even make sense? So he's looking at these things, and like that example right there, there's a time to tear and a time to sow. You know, in a sense, he's, he's putting these things together, and these things that, I mean, in one sense, you could say, well, yeah, why, why, why do you have to have both of these things? Or why? Because what, what are some of these things that, are, that he's listing? I mean, you have some good things, and you have... It's more negative, like war, war and peace, right? I mean, war is one of the worst things that happens in the world. Yeah. It, and, well, from a human perspective, I mean, even though we, I mean, this is the irony, even though, you know, we run to war and conflict, it, you know, that, at least kind of verbally, none of us want it. We don't want conflict in our life. We want peace. There's a, there's a deep desire just to, for everybody to get along and, and we have peace. But he says there's a time for war and a time for peace. So you have these kind of good and bad things going on, right? What, what else, you guys, uh, any other things you, you think of? Yeah, David. Him coming at things from like the wisdom point of view, this whole very experience of things is very frustrating when we're trying to like analyze every situation of, well, what's the right thing to do now? Just this analysis by paralysis by analysis. Yeah, and again, I'm glad you brought that up too because... What, what what did Solomon say he's specifically trying to figure out? You guys remember? He says it a couple different times in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So yeah, generally speaking, he's trying to figure out how things go together and work. How, to, how, to, how can he even make sense of this, especially with this wisdom that God gave him? But do you guys remember what he's specifically trying to figure out? It has to do with that do or make word. Yeah, he's trying to figure out, hey, what is, what is good? Again, this is where we were talking about how does, what does this say about Solomon's heart in relationship to God, okay? So Solomon's trying to figure out what is good. It's that same word for good that God uses in, in uh, Genesis chapter 1. God has already determined what is good. We did this last week, okay? So God has already determined what's good for man to do. But guess what Tom Solomon's trying to figure out? He's trying to figure out what's good for man to do. So he says that twice in chapter 1 and chapter 2. That I, I'm, I'm looking at, at the world, I'm looking at my life, and I'm trying to figure out what is good for, and I think he said, the children of heaven or the children of man to do or to make. That's that word, to do or, or to make. So Solomon's trying to figure this out. So that's kind of the context, David. He's looking at all this stuff and trying to figure out, yeah, how do we make sense of it? And what, what's good for us? to be a part of or to do. He uses the word toil uh, early on. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything really significant about the word season. Uh, I looked up the definition of that and it says appointed time. Now, this is really interesting. So I'm, I'm kind of giving away some things here. But there's, here's something else I do in Bible Hub that I never used to do. So I'm looking up the definition 
Just simple definition of the word to see, because you, often you'll see there's a perhaps a different word that's kind of the main word for that Hebrew word or Greek. Um, and then it gives you all the different uh, Bible versions or interpretations, translations. So I, I usually skim that real quick because you can pick up really quick um, kind of what might be an emphasis. So you can see like a couple of different emphases, um, main, main emphasis. Uh, and what, and I've never even used this translation before, but it, it says this, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then they add here, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. Which is really interesting, even though that wasn't there in the, in the Hebrew, and people can make a, you know, you know, make a, point that, oh, that's bad, they added stuff in here. Well, they're adding that in there based on what's coming next. And what is what is that translation introduced to you based on, and for instance, my translation here that I think is the NAS, New American Standard, just says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So God isn't mentioned there at all, but yet that interpretation says at the end, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. So kind of what's the thought that's introduced? What's that sound like to you? Greg just whispered gently and softly. Sovereignty. Anything else? Well, that's interesting. So what, why, what struck you... How did that strike you like that, as far as fatalism? Um, just if you take that one thought of all the time, make it a simple nugget of everything happens because God wants it to. I fall under that. I don't know. So as far as like your flavor and how you hear that, that's kind of where you go? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I was just going that out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, some people, depending on kind of how you're raised and understanding even that word sovereignty, can, can immediately go there. But, hey, that, that may just be your flavor. So fatalism, it's kind of like, hey, whatever, God chose it to happen. And, yeah, I can, I can acknowledge that that happened, but it's kind of a, there's kind of a negative, which is interesting because if, if you read the next, you know, the, the, the next seven verses, yeah, you could go there too. Maybe, you know, maybe Solomon, maybe Solomon is kind of going... Hey, whatever, God, you know, God, God appointed that time to happen. He appointed those things to happen. So, you know, so be it, whatever. What'd you say? Oh, I said, what's the point? Kind of, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see if that's where he goes. And I'll tell you, I, I don't think that's where he goes here, okay? Um, but it's a, it's a good point. So I'm not going to break down every one of the words in that, in that um, block of verses through verse 8, because I want to get to what I think is the main point here. So, uh, verse 9. He says, What gain has the worker from his toil? So what gain has the worker from his toil? Again, the word worker, anybody else have a different word there? It's all worker? Okay. Um, that's derived from the word to do or make. That same word that we talked about in chapter 1 where Solomon says, what's, what's good for man to do? Well, that that uh, verb that's used there is that word to do or to make. So this is the noun portion of that verb. You want to get a grammar lesson, so it's the noun portion. But it's, again, it's interesting when you see kind of the same, the same words or the same derivative of a word continue to be repeated uh, in Scripture. So what, what gain has the worker from his toil? And any, any, any thoughts? It's just an easy, kind of an easy verse there. Verse 10, he says, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So he, he, I have seen the, and this says, um, I just read business. And what other words do you guys have? Task. Task. I saw another one. It's really interesting. It's interesting, too, in light of what you just said, David. I saw another one that said burden, which to me, burden takes a, a negative connotation. Doesn't necessarily mean at that point in time that that's what the you know, the person using that uh, meant, but I, I immediately go to kind of a negative idea 
uh, with, with burden. So task, um, business. So I've seen the task that God has given to the children of man to be occupied or to be busy with. Um, so now I want to bring in, again, what, what we know about God to begin with. So again, the bigger, broader context that we've already talked about in Genesis chapter 1. What has God determined when he made man and he even made work for, for people? What, what can we believe that God determined? It was good. It was good. Right. Sorry, that was, that was kind of a quiz question. That it was good. So God makes, makes uh, Adam and Eve... And even after, and this is where we're, you know, even after Adam and Eve, I say after. So God tells Adam and Eve what to do, and he, he says that it's good. I don't think he explicitly says, I'm, I'm giving you a task. Actually, in that, actual, uh, it's, I think, chapter 1, verse 28, and I think it's through, like, 32 in Genesis. He actually does say that it's good, but he gives a good task, a good work for man to do. And, and it's the same words. Um, to do or to make. So he gives this task, which is to do or to make, to people, and it's good for them. And he tells them, hey, go, go and do this. Do this. And what's this? What do we know that God tells them in Genesis chapter 1? Steward the earth. Work, work the land. Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Be fruitful and multiply. Work the land. Had dominion over the animals and the and the other stuff that, that I created. That's kind of a weird word. That, that almost is just like a King Jamesy Bible word. Have dominion over. What, what other words would you use? Manage it. Manage it. You're in charge of it. And that was good. I I, I mean, gotta be careful because. Ronnie and I just had this conversation about a conversation that happened recently in light of this whole COVID thing and what's happening with our society and this kind of move towards socialism. Um, and, and more and more it seems that people don't want to work. That work is deemed as something... Well, what, what, what do most people think of work as? Not good. Not good. It's a burden. <laughs> to, to use one of the words. It's unnecessary. Why? So all those words, toil, busyness, burden, task, from a human perspective, back to, back to Adam and Eve, and again, what, what we determine, God has determined it to be good, but guess what people think? It's not, it's not good. It's a burden. Yeah, great. Which is interesting because you brought up a different word for busy, which is occupied. Be occupied by something is, in my brain is different than just being busy doing something. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I can be either occupied or busy. And if I'm occupied, I'm kind of involved, you know? So. Okay. So I think occupied, for me, in this text, gives me a deeper understanding of God's will. It's not that I'm just supposed to be busy. I guess, you stuff. know, get, get down there and be busy, be great. Busy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, to be occupied, to be engaged in, in, this, in this task, in this work. So I have it in, this, in my notes here. If we believe God is good, then this task is meant for our good also. So already tying back to Genesis chapter 1, God gives us work to do, something to be occupied with, and... He determined that it's good, that it's pleasing, it's desirable, it's useful, and it's suitable. And not just kind of generally speaking, but for you and I specifically. Again, I, I, I want to keep tying this out. You know, what's, what's this remind us or tell us about God? And when God says something is good, it's not just, oh, it's, it's good, as if it's some generic word. He's thinking, I believe, and, and the way this helps me, is he's thinking of, I believe it's not just generally speaking, it's me specifically. He means this to be pleasing, desirable, useful, and suitable for me and for you. So uh, Solomon says, I've seen the business 
that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And then in verse 11, he says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. So just stop there before we go to the other part of that verse. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Now what did Solomon just lay out in the beginning of this chapter? There's a time for everything. So that's why I'm, I'm saying, so David, you took it as kind of like this fatalist, it could be this fatalist idea, like, you know, what's the use? But yeah, he's already introducing God in here now, and he's saying what? Now, I, I, this translation says beautiful. Um, but that, what other words do you guys have? Appropriate. Appropriate? Huh. What, what uh, translation is that? New American Standard. America, New American Standard. Um, God makes everything appropriate in its time. What else? What word is that, Ronnie? I thought I had it in my notes right here. I thought that was the word good. No. It's a different word? That actually comes here in ver uh, verse 12. So, it says everything is beautiful. It's interesting because the, the main part of that word is referring to this idea of being beautiful or fair, or fair not being equal, but fair as in it looks good um, in its time. So this is interesting. So he says, for everything there's a season. So he, again, we have this idea that God is with us in this life. He's with Solomon in this life. And Solomon is now determining that God has made everything, and he uses this word beautiful, in its time. And, and he's including everything that he just said. Which is interesting, because again, if you think about war, him specifically using the, the word war, you know, I'm thinking of death and killing and murder and, you know, sinful stuff that is included in that, in that, those seven verses. Yeah, Jack. I kind of like the appropriate, like, when you're defending the orphans or the I think there's an appropriate time for war. Okay. Okay. He also used the word hate. He used the word hate? Yes, he did. Yep. A time to love and a time to hate. That's interesting, Jack, that you, that you go there. Because, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good observation. That there's a time. It's a good observation in that it's interesting how we explain things or can justify things. And I don't mean that from a negative perspective, but to immediately jump to that, like war. Hey, that war is appropriate or killing may be appropriate when we're defending, you said, widows and orphans. Okay, but, but he includes the word hate right there. And, and, you know, Scripture tells us that there's, is there ever a good time to hate? Or to my mom, you always hate <laughs> yeah, the devil. Sounds like, you always hate the devil. Always. <laughs> okay, he doesn't say we hate the devil here. Okay, so, um, yeah, we can hate the devil. Number one, God includes, includes everything about life right there in, the, in that first, first seven verses, I think, okay? In a very interesting way. And then Solomon says, hey, God has determined that everything in its own time is, is beautiful or appropriate. That's real interesting, isn't it? Now, I want you to think about this. You're not... You're not on hate. Hate is a huge burden. Okay. He in. He what? God, Jesus Christ recognizes his end when he um, told the disciple, get behind me, Satan. I mean, he wasn't speaking to the disciple. I think God recognizes the enemy and hates him. Okay. This is interesting because we're, we're, we're associating hate with God right now, which uh, is, is I, I think it's appropriate to do, and uh, it's easy to do. Um, but I want you to think about it, hate, in terms of, like, your own life, you personally. Okay? It's, it's, it can be easy to justify some of these things, war, killing, hate, and, and we put it in, in God's court, and especially us good Christian people, we can jump on that bandwagon, but I, you personally, in thinking about hate, I, you know, my, I, you guys know this, I've told you this a, a thousand times, you know, my, my flavor of emotion and where I go, as far as the fruits of a frustrated sovereign, 
And my dark side is anger, frustration, and impatience. And it's never appropriate. I mean, that's just me. I'm not teaching you guys that. That's, that's for me. I know my anger, my, and I could, I, I could say, well, I don't want to get into this debate about righteous anger, okay? That's not where we're going. I want you to keep this in your court, in your heart, you knowing yourself, and where you go with, with the bad stuff of life, the bad emotions, the fruits of a frustrated sovereign, not the fruits of the Spirit. All that stuff is, is, an, is the reason why we need to be saved, again, from ourself. I don't need to be saved necessarily from my sin that's out here somewhere. No, it's in here and I need to be saved and delivered from myself. And that's what Jesus offers to do. Yeah, great. So along those lines, and just from a different angle, I believe that if, if we just look at checking boxes, you know, if we just say, okay, war is appropriate here, but not here, or wars, war has this beautiful ability to glorify God for who he is and us for who we are, if we just put it in that box and we see man and how he enters into warfare. I think it's a beautiful outcome for man to go, man, I really need God, because that's my natural nature. That's who I am. And God uses it in my life to show me who I am. Okay, so stop right there. You guys hear what he said? God uses that in my life to show me who I am. And, and to show me who he is. To show me who he is. This is our mantra, okay? This is what we're talking about every Sunday, okay, guys? And, and, and you just gave, thanks, Greg, you just gave away this morning's lesson. Coffee downstairs. <laughs> but let's see how this happens in, chap in this chapter, okay? And I'm not going to finish the whole chapter. But again, this is, I, yeah, we can, we can go down the, the trail of trying to, to explain all of these things that he says in uh, verses 1 through 7. You know, war, hate, all the bad stuff in a, in a big general sense. Like, you know, why would we go to war to, to defend widows and orphans? Well, that, yeah, I want you to, to boil it down to you, okay? And, and let's not get distracted with, you know, trying to go down explaining a lot of that other stuff. There is one main purpose that you are still here in this life that includes all of those things in verses 1 through 7. And that's what Solomon is getting at here. He's getting at it kind of in a different way that I, is, is very helpful for me, and I hope it's going to be helpful for you. But like what uh, Greg just said, and, and something that I make it a, a point every Sunday to talk about, because I think that's what every story in Scripture is, telling us is that there's a reason why God is allowing you to continue to live in the body that you have, in the age that you have, and in the, in the time that we're in. And why is that? Greg just said it. He's, help, he's exposing me to me. And he's exposing me to me. Um, well, we talk about, I, I don't, I was just going to ask, you know, for you guys to fill that in again, but we talk about that every, every Sunday. He's exposing me for who I am which is a creature in need of help, and guess where my help comes from? And then it exposes him for who he is. Who is the helper? He is my main help, and that's what he's doing right here. So, uh, verse 11, he, um, he has made, he does, everything beautiful or fair in its time. And in my notes here, it said he's referring to, to verses 3 through 8 right there, all that stuff. So all that stuff that Solomon lists there, hate, War, sowing, tearing, gathering, throwing, all that stuff I think is supposed to you know, be little pictures of really everything that, that is happening in my life. God is doing, and it's beautiful to God. And again, think, think, try to compartmentalize this regarding you, not your kids, not our nation, not anything else but you. Um, so even the bad stuff, and again, what's our perspective of the bad stuff? When war happens to me, 
when conflict happens to, to me, when hate happens to me, when tearing happens to me, what, what is your immediate thought, generally speaking? It's not good. It's bad. What are, what are a whole bunch of other words that we could put there? It's not fair. Joe, it's got, God's got the wrong guy. It's evil. Yes? Uh, it just makes me think of Romans 8, 28. Not necessarily at that time, particularly for me, like if I'm talking to my kids and pointing out that uh, everything that happens to us, if we love him or his, is for our good. And we've actually seen some of the results of that. Things that look bad that led us to a good thing. We don't have guarantees, I guess, that we're going to see that end result. But there are things that we can point to. If this didn't happen, then that wouldn't happen. Or So I even earlier you said like the season is not necessarily you know, relevant or whatever. But to me, thinking about these things in seasons, too, gives me hope. <laughs> you know, like... I don't know, somebody said one time with trials, you're either about to go into one, you're coming out of one, or I don't know how, you know what, has anybody heard that thing or whatever? And it, the, the reason why going through something difficult, I feel like I can keep my head up, is the hope that it's a season, or that it's a short time. And there's another one coming around the corner, but we'll get through this. And we trust. Romans 8.28 says what? Um, yep, and, and Paul specifically is saying all things. Right, so all of that. Solomon right here is saying all those things. It's interesting, you know, thinking about a season too. Uh, I think it was purposeful with, uh, with most uh, interpretations is that every season has its purpose. You know, if you think about our four seasons that we understand, every one of them has a, a distinct and good purpose. So here, he says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Let's see if I had anything else there. And then, um, and then look what he says next, which is interesting. He says, also he has put eternity into man's heart. Yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Any thoughts about that? Kind of a strange verse. Yeah, Jeff. I just as I look back at that list in one through eight, you know, everything that appears there, the the uh, contrast on the left side is all things that well, not always, but a lot of them are ones that we would say are negative. But at least it's involved something that we humanly would say is negative and something we Here, this issue of like eternity, I think there's a sense in which we could say, going back to the beginning, when he said, Hey, the day you eat from that tree, when you determine for yourself what is good, you will die, right? And all the, the negative aspects of the curse, the tearing, the killing, the warfare, all those manifestations of the curse that we live with all the time, in a sense, I think God, like zooming out here, it's like God saying, Look, that, that is a part of life that has been since the beginning. In that can all be classified as good because in the variance and the ups and the downs and the harder days and the easier days and the mourning and the laughter and in all that variance of life, it awakens you to the reality of a need for an eternity. There, there has to be transcendent. This book cries out for transcendent. Like in this world, something's empty, something's missing. And God's like been saying, look, I designed it that way for you to see that in a sense, while he is absolutely involved in his creation, he, he is he is missing in the human heart if he doesn't intrude, if he doesn't enter, if he doesn't <clears throat> involve God with us, if he doesn't come. So if you could say, in all that variance, there's something God has set within that experience to, to point man upward, to set eternity in their heart. There is more than just the temporal, the fleeting, you know? Okay. Yeah, anything else before I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, 
specific anthropology of humans, that we have eternity in our hearts, we have a longing for eternity, but we're stuck here in time. And so that, you know, that, uh, that poem begins in the chapter, he's talking about the absurdity of, of um, how things have been resolved. That, you know, that, um, so, so as humans, we're frustrated by that, and we have eternity in our hearts, but we don't know the end from the beginning. So anyway, I think it's a, a key statement to the, to the anthropology. Yeah, and what, what I think is interesting here is, you know, the first, uh, up till now, you get this sense that Solomon, he's looking for something. And we talked about this in the first two weeks, that he, he's trying to get or gain purpose and satisfaction in understanding stuff. And he's already admitted that he didn't get that with his working, with his toiling. But he's already started to point to God and said, well, wait a minute, there's something different with God. And right here, especially with this, because that's kind of a weird verse. <clears throat> and yet, I mean, the points you guys made are great. This idea that, hey, God has input something into our hearts that's, that gives us an indication of something different than us just being here. And what it ties to with what we've, we've already talked about is this idea that, hey, there is a purpose and meaning. I think that's what Solomon is realizing, that God has a purpose and meaning, because that's what he's, he's already introduced us to right now. So we still go through that life that he listed, <clears throat> which is both good and bad stuff. And he's already saying, hey, God intends for all of that to be beautiful. All of that is working with what Paul says in Romans, for our good and his glory. God says, I'm, I'm working all that stuff for you, not just you. We know, I, I say that, it's not just you know all you all out here that we can generally understand, yeah, we're all going to heaven one day. No, God is specifically working in, <clears throat> in Greg's heart, um, in Don's heart, through what is happening. And this, this interesting verse here about eternity, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I wrote, it comes from another translation, he has put in eternity into man's heart, yet they cannot fathom the work that God has done from beginning to end. Now that's really interesting because I think that's tying together this idea of what he's already introduced right here. That, hey, God is working all of these things for your good and it's beautiful. It's good. And he, he's doing that not just now, but from the beginning to the end and for all of eternity. Yeah, so it's introducing a, a real like mind-blowing concept. Yeah, great. So I've got a, a note that says the word find or find out is and it has a sense of figuring out or comprehending by study. So you're not going to get this by cross-reference. Oh, okay, yeah, now I get it, I'm okay. Everything's fine. Everything's great. It drives me back to, I need help getting this. I need a heart, not a, not a PowerPoint. It's not just information. Not bad. And you yeah, said getting this, bad. meaning what? Getting what? This. This war I'm engaged in, this hatred I'm engaged in, this hatred that's pointed at me, this this thing where I get it fixed and it tears, this, you know, this, this conundrum of life. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go, okay, yeah, I know that's good and that's good. Oh yeah, war, that's okay. No, no problem. Yeah, hate me? Great. Hate you? Great. Everything's fine. Because yeah, how many of you have tried to gut this out? Like, you know the information. You know, the, the Bible tells me that this thing I'm experiencing right now is good. So, exactly. I'm going to push real hard until I really believe it. So, I'll end with this. Because if I could figure it out, if I could study it, if I could comprehend by study, then I could make myself a little box that I could check. And I could gut it out. Which is interesting, Carolyn, because you said that. I mean, you, you kind of referred to that. But you go through these seasons, and in the midst of it, it just seems terrible. It seems wrong. It seems not fair. How, how can God... I mean, I mean I, I've either gone through things or know of things that people have gone through that you, you look at that and go, really, God? I mean, you, you had to do it that way? It doesn't even make any sense. Again, that's me using my human kingship, my own little s sovereignty to armchair quarterback God, but then 
later on, as I continue to go through that, you go, oh. And that couldn't happen just at, with, with information. I had the information already, right? Oh yeah, I, I know that everything God allows to happen in my life is intended for my good and His glory. A good, reformed statement. <clears throat> Believing in God's sovereignty, right? But God has us here together with Him, Emmanuel, and He brings us along in a way in which He really helps us to believe it. And that's what we were talking about, that tying together of um, knowledge and feelings, I think, in the, like the first week where, you know, all of us can claim that we believe this stuff, but when does it really bring hope and peace and comfort, or how does that happen? And that's what God's doing in each of your lives as he's bringing you through this life, which Solomon is giving us a picture of. So again, uh, referring, again, I'm right there in, in verse 11, there's a time and a season for everything, and it is good, it is intended for our good, and we can't fathom that. Death rooting up hatred when it happens to us does not seem to make sense in the moment. However, it is, and that's what Solomon is saying here, it's God's work in and for us. Verse 12, I'm not even going to make it through the, I want to get through 16. Verse 12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. So here's, he's kind of answering what he kind of said that he was setting out to do, where he's trying to figure out what is good for the children of man to do under heaven. And here he just gives us this amazing concept that, wow, you know what? God is working through everything in life and he's determined it to be good and he's using it to do good in your life. And then he says this. He just says, and so then I perceive that there's nothing better for them to do for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. So here I, I wrote for kind of a different, I know there's nothing better for them, the children of man, than to rejoice or be glad. And then there's that word, and to do or to make. And then there's that word, uh, for them to be joyful and to do good. You guys have any other words there? Is that 13? That's 12. Okay. To do good as long as they live. Again, I think it, it should immediately usher us to, to Genesis and what God has declared to be good. God said, I gave you a task to be occupied with, and it's intended for your good. And, and what's, the, what's the big fullness behind just that little task that we're being given? Whatever it is. What's the big fullness that we can believe that it's good, no matter what we're doing? Hey, you guys, you guys hear that? It's from God. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of me right here and how often <clears throat> I am dissatisfied. How often I'm dissatisfied with my job. Or any task that I'm doing. <laughs> For me, being the impatient, frustrated person that I am, I'm, I'm constantly thinking that there's something better to do. And for me, that's whether it's more fulfilling or more profitable or... So I, in the midst of doing something I might enjoy, I'm still looking forward or past that and thinking, okay, what's either what's the next thing or, gosh, it, it, it just fills me with dissatisfaction, frustration, impatience. I mean, what this does for me is it is it brings to mind all of those verses that we've talked about before as far as uh, rest. You know, be still and know, the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. And this idea of just being able to rest in Him. And I can be satisfied in anything that I'm doing. This is interesting for me too, because I grew up in the charismatic church, charismatic realm. And for me, I, I used to believe that God had designed me specifically for one particular job or one thing. And, and when I find that thing, if I ever find that thing, I would be filled with amazing purpose, satisfaction, 
joy, and, and from my perspective at that point in time, I mean all the time. I'd be happy all the time. I'd be satisfied all the time. Because, man, I, I am doing what God wants me to do. And I found it. You know how many times I thought I, I found that in my life? No, no, I thought I found it multiple times in my life. And as soon as I thought I found it, how quick do you think that left to where I thought, no, no, this isn't what... And it usually happens because there's conflict or some, some bad human stuff happened, and now all of a sudden, this can't be from God. This, this was the thing. This is what I'm called to do. This is what is wrapped up in my purpose and meaning and satisfaction. And now I'm on... Now, now I'm, especially for me and the... the, the the way I was built then, you know, I used to think that, that there's one main railroad track that God has us destined for. And, it, when, and when, you, when you get on that track, oh man, life is awesome. I mean, that's the way it is for marriage, for parenting, and everything else. If I'm on the tr that track, my marriage is going to be awesome. When I'm on that track, my job, I'm going to be satisfied, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be fulfilled. And, and, as soon as I'm not happy, satisfied, or fulfilled, I'm immediately believing I'm not on that track anymore. And I'm on this search for, okay, what decision did I make? Where, at what intersection did I decide to go the wrong way? And now I'm off God's track. And it's just, I, I mean, it's like a crazy curse. As far as now, I'm trying to figure out how to get back on God's track. You know, I think it's way more simpler than that. There is not one train track that God is on destined you for, and you need to find it in order to be satisfied and happy and fulfilled in your life. There's a very simplistic way of look, looking at this that God is saying, you know what? I've given you work to do. I've given you a life. I've given you relationships. And, yeah, in this life, it's still hard. It's still ugly. It's still dirty. And I am Emmanuel, God with you. And everything I'm allowing to happen on the train track that you are on, guess what he's allowing it to happen for? We've already said it. For my good and his glory. And guess what he uses? Everything. Specifically, weakness, sin, bad stuff that humans do to each other. Of course, I argue, especially from, a, from an athlete sports point of view, guess what people learn the most from? Failures. The bad stuff. The hard stuff. You get a, you get a young kid that, that is a good basketball player, and if he just experiences success and good, he never, underst he never understands what his... Uh, where his weaknesses are, and where he needs to build up, and where he needs to learn. So, I didn't make it to 16. Let me just finish, I'll finish reading. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful. I think that gets at what he's talking about earlier, being satisfied, and to do good as long as they live. Then he says, and also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. And then... You see what he says there? At the end there? That is God's gift to man. Now do you think that gift is just merely kind of the, the food and drink that he's talking about? What's, what's a fuller way perhaps, just based on what we've talked about in this chapter so far, what's, what's the joy that he's talking about or the gift that God is giving? What, Greg? Greg? I'm just looking at the board because it's kind of, that's a clue. Well, it's him that's the gift. He's with us. God is the gift. He's doing pleasing, suitable, useful stuff. Yeah, Greg said, God is doing pleasing, desirable, useful, suitable stuff in your life. In essence, he's saying, guys, you can just rest. You can enjoy your toil, even if you're retired. Enjoy your toil. Harder than Experience joy. Be satisfied because I am God with you.
and everything that's happening in your life is intended is intended for your good and my glory. We got to stop when we pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for these words of Solomon. I thank you for giving us scripture, God, and, and I thank you that it's simple. I thank you that you are involved in every person's life that is here this morning. And that you are actively working in everything in their life for their good and your glory. God, help us to believe that. Help us to rest in it. Help us to experience satisfaction and joy and even gentleness as a result of being able to rest in you and trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.